So, uh, good morning. Um, I started rec recording. So, can you hear me and see the screen? Sì, sì, professore, vediamo e sentiamo. Very good. So, uh, this was the last, uh, these uh, figures you see uh, on the screen are the, the uh, uh, relevant to the last exercise we, we considered in the last practice two weeks ago. Uh, so the, our goal was to uh, analyze uh, a rocket operating in uh, overexpanding conditions uh, where we have uh, this uh, summer field criterion that tell us that the separation occurs when the exit, the ambient pressure is four times the exit pressure. And uh, we know the value of C star, uh, we know the adiabatic specific, uh, adiabatic, the adapted specific impulse, and also the molar mass, 14 kilograms per kilomol, and gamma, 1.2, and also how the uh, pressure changes with altitude. Here, uh, Z is in kilometers. And uh, of course, we have also the, the Use useful constants, sea uh, level, uh, acceleration of gravity, and universal gas constant. And so we had to evaluate uh, the values of total temperature and total pressure for this rocket. So perhaps some of you uh, uh, did the exercise. I will uh, show you now how to solve it. So let me leave the, the, the numbers uh, uh, visible. The first thing to say is that from these two uh, quantities here, we can uh, derive the, the, the exit pressure, which is of course is PA over this pi, and it will be 0 0.25, 0 0.25 bar. Uh, then we can, uh, of course, also get the, the equivalent exhaust velocity or the specific impulse in meter per second, multiplying the ISP by 9.81, and uh, so it will be 130 multiply 9.81, and it will be 4218.3 meter per second. So these are two information that can be directly uh, obtained from here. So uh, our goal is to identify our uh, total pressure and temperature. And uh, so we can resort to the C star, 40, and uh, for the, the knowing PE, of course, to 4P0, we can uh, uh, resort on the ratio of P0 over P, which is uh, related to the expansion ratio, uh, so to the area ratio, and at the end on the, we can, uh, as we have our gamma, we know the performance in adapted condition, we can obtain the uh, trust coefficient, and we know that the trust coefficient is just a function of gamma and epsilon or P0 over PE. So uh, we know uh, this is the inadapted condition. So we know C star and we can obtain our trust coefficient in adapted condition. As uh, one point 858, and uh, from here, uh, we can, oops, sorry, 
Um, yes, from here we go back to the definition of, or back to the relationship that allow us to express the trust coefficient as a function of pressure ratio, which is the following. You recall it. And from here, we can, uh, of course, extract our unknown. This will be uh, CF squared over gamma squared, uh, gamma minus one, two over gamma is one minus PE over P zero, gamma minus one over gamma. And so PE over P zero will be equal to 1 minus CF adapted condition squared over gamma squared, gamma minus 1 over 2 gamma, and all will be to the power gamma over gamma minus 1. Result is that P0 over PE is 1008, and as a consequence, our P0 will be 252 bar. Uh, coming back to, to this relation here, we can uh, obtain that uh, gamma squared sista squared uh, will be equal to RT0, which is universal gas constant molar mass T0, and so T0 is uh, M over R, gamma C star squared, or 3650 Kelvin. So we have done uh, what was required. It was also, uh, I don't remember if I gave you also this, but uh, uh, another possible thing is to evaluate the adaptation altitude this is trivial because we have just to evaluate what is the altitude where uh, we have uh, pe equal to 0.25 bar So we know that uh, Z is equal to uh, one minus from the, the relation we have seen above, um, we have seen before, is one minus P over P S L to one over five point two five six. and 0 0.0226. And so we substitute here 0.25, so it, this is one quarter here, so it's three quarter to this power, and at the end, the result is 10.26 kilometers. Uh, you can also check by yourself what, uh, just for, for this example, that if you consider the real nozzle expansion, you will recall that we have here something like uh, this, with this P sup, P sup, subsonic, supersonic point, and uh, we identify here P and S as a normal shock point, and you can see where is here on this line, you can evaluate, of course, this PSU is our um, 0.25 bar. And uh, from the pressure ratio, you can evaluate the Mach number or directly the uh, this value of uh, normal that we have with normal shock at the exit. And we, we see that this is about 
five times this pressure. Whereas we have separation quite earlier, so perhaps here, if this is a log scale, uh, it will be P separation, which is just four times the exit uh, pressure. So let's see now another exercise, and possibly we try to do this together now, and it's the following. Uh, we see some data from observation uh, related to a missile, and uh, in particular we are able to evaluate the exit diameter of uh, the, the, the engine, which is one meter, and the exit pressure, because by, by the edge of the plume, for instance, we can uh, infer that this will be 0.8 bar. We observe that the burning time is 100 seconds, and we know that uh, it's a missile of such a kind that we expect gamma of the order 1.2 and C star of the order uh, 1,500 meters per second. From trajectory, we uh, understand that the uh, trust will increase of 10% from sea level to burnout. So we have that uh, trust at burnout is equal to trust at sea level plus 10% of trust at sea level. And uh, burnout altitude is 20 kilometers. So to, to understand something about uh, this rocket, we make uh, some further assumption besides these two here. We can also assume that the pressure doesn't change. Total pressure is constant. And uh, so we can also exploit the, the relation we have just seen for uh, the pressure with altitude. And uh, we assume that uh, if the former law is valid for uh, Z less than 11 kilometers, for higher altitudes, we assume that pressure is the pressure at 11 kilometers, the, ambient, the atmospheric pressure. And then by the, this function, which is the exponential function of minus point 1578 z minus 11. z is always in kilometers in these expressions. So this is for z greater than 11. Former for z less than 11 kilo kilometers and this one for z greater than 11 kilometers. So what we have to, to evaluate, what do you like to see here? We like to evaluate uh, what is trust, at sea level and burnout. What is P0? Uh, what is the trot diameter? What is the mass flow rate? and uh, vacuum-specific impulse. So this is the exercise. We have a number of uh, observed data that to, uh, to translate more information. So I'll leave you just uh, a minute to have, uh, to think about it.
So let's start from the, the, the first point, which is to determine the trust level. <clears throat> of course, we can exploit the, the expression of trust in general can be, as we have different altitudes, we can make evident dependence, dependence on the altitude through the atmospheric pressure. So we can resort to this expression. And you can easily see that from this, we can obtain the unknowns, because of course we know here the, the value of pressure and exit area. So, for instance, if you consider the trust at sea level, because we know this relation, we would like to exploit this relation. So, you see there is a relation between, of course, we know the trust once you know this unknown, which is the adapted trust, because uh, for the other cases, we always know our PE is one of the data here. AE through the E is one of the data, so we have just this unknown. And we can exploit this relation uh, to, this is one equation that is a function of uh, our unknown. So we have uh, one uh, equation, one unknown, and we can solve it. Uh, because uh, at sea level and at burnout, we know the pressure, the atmospheric pressure. So we have all the data we need. So we can write FSL is equal to adapted trust plus PE minus PSL AE and trust a 20 kilometers is simply this relation. You see here the, we can, uh, of course, as we have a relation between, uh, we can we have to exploit then at this point this relation here, and we say that uh, uh, F20 is equal to FSL plus multiplied by 1.1. And uh, so we can also uh, eliminate here, we can directly evaluate our FSL eliminating uh, this adapted trust from these two equations make the difference. And we see that the difference F20 uh, minus FSL is 0.1. FSL will be PE minus P20 AE minus PE minus PSL AE. So we see that for this case, you don't even need the, the knowledge of PE to evaluate our trust at sea level. 
So we, we will use different values here, which are PSL, of course, is the atmospheric pressure, P11 kilometers is 22, and this is helpful because we have to switch from one relation to the other. Is uh, 22,627 Pascal, and P20 results to be from these relations 5,473 5, Pascal. So, uh, by substitute, ah, yes, we need also AE is pi e squared over four. And this is, uh, is 0 0.785 square meters. And we can solve for FSL and obtain 752.8 kilonewton. Mm. Not a small trust. In seven, 75 tons of trust. Uh, so, uh, of course, once we know that the trust at sea level multiplied by 1.1, and we know also now the required trust, which is at 20 kilometers. is 828.1 kilonewtons. So uh, at this point, uh, if you like, you can also compute the, the vacuum trust That is, uh, of course, uh, is adapted plus PE AE or C level plus PSL AE. And it'll be a little bit higher, 832.4 kilonewtons. Adapted trust. In this case, we need the value of P. We have to know where is uh, the, the, the adaptation. So we need to know in this case the value of uh, exit pressure and we obtain 769.6. Next uh, uh, um, question was to evaluate the total pressure. And at this point, we know the trust. And the first thing that you can imagine when you, you know the trust and you think of pressure, of course, there is the relation between trust and pressure through the trust coefficient. So let's see if there is chance to evaluate this chamber pressure once we know the, 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 the trust level. So uh, of course, to make things easier, it's better to refer to the adapted condition where we have no pressure term. So we have just the impulsive part of trust. So the second item is to evaluate P0. And we exploit the 
this relation we turn on here. Uh, so this is not uh, easy at this point because we have no information of any of these quantities. We just know uh, the this, the trust, but uh, we can exploit the information that we have uh, to evaluate exactly our P0. In fact, you, you know that here, this is a function in general of P0 over PE and gamma, and we know gamma. Uh, we can also uh, say that as we know PE, we can consider here the unknown, the ratio P0 over PE because we know PE. And also, here we know AE, and we also know that AE over AT is a function of P0 over PE and gamma. So exploiting this relation, we understand that we can find a single equation for determination of P0 over PE, given the value of the adapted trust, and so uh, once we have P0 over P, of course, we can just multiply by P and get our required uh, P0. So we write again this expression divided by the known quantities P, E, A, E. And uh, this is an, something that can be easily evaluated. It's 12, it's a non-dimensional quantity, 12. 0.255 because we know the adapted trust, we know P, we know A. And this will be, uh, of course, based on this expression, we have to divide by PE and AE. So is trust coefficient P0 over PE and AT over AE so that we can exploit at this point the relation that we know, because CF is gamma square root two gamma or gamma minus one, one minus PE over P zero gamma minus one over gamma. And we know also AE over AT is gamma divided by square root two gamma or gamma minus one, PE over P0, 2 over gamma, 1 minus PE over P0, gamma minus 1 over gamma. So you see that we have the first term uh, C is here, and the second term is the inverse. And so we can uh, write this exp explicitly and say 12.255 will be gamma square root 2 gamma gamma minus 1 1 p e p 0 gamma minus 1 over gamma that multiplies square root 2 gamma or gamma minus 1 p e p 0 over 2 gamma this is the inverse of the area ratio expressions function of pressure ratio This must be divided by gamma, capital gamma. And, uh, and finally, we have also P0 over P here. We simplify our capital gamma. We see that we have uh, these terms present in the CF expression, which are also present under square root on this side. So we have 12.255 equal to 2 gamma over gamma, gamma minus 1, 1 minus PE over P0, gamma minus 1 over gamma, and then what is left is this term here, which is 2 uh, to the power 2 over gamma and to the, to the power 1 half, because it's under square root, and then we have this P0 over PE. 
So here we have PE over P0, 1 over gamma, and P0 over P. So we are to this expression. We can further uh, simplify considering that here, if you look to P0 over PE, is 1 minus 1 over gamma, which is equal to gamma minus 1 over gamma, of course. So we have here these two terms together is P0 over PE to gamma minus 1 over gamma. That multiplied by this term in squared parentheses becomes uh, clearly P0 over PE gamma minus 1 over gamma, and then it's divided by itself, so it's minus 1. So we can solve at this point for P0 over P. And this is our 12 is F adapted condition P E A E plus one and all to the power gamma over gamma minus one. And this results to be 68.18. Given the value of P, our total pressure is 54.55 bar. So I hope it's clear. Um, so you see that from some data, we can go back to uh, relevant information. And uh, the next step will be to evaluate the other quantities. This will be easier. So I think this was the, the uh, more uh, most indirect uh, relation, the, the, the one that we had to evaluate our P0. Then we have to evaluate our trot diameter. And this is easy because we know the E. And at this point, as we know, P0 over PE, we also know our epsilon. So uh, the E and epsilon, of course, will give us our DT. And uh, we, we exploit the relation we have just written above. This one. We substitute uh, PE over P0 and gamma. Capital gamma is 0 0.6485. And so we obtain that our epsilon is 8.885. So our, because our gamma as I said, is 0.6485. And we find that dt is, of course, the e square root of divided by square root of epsilon. And this point 0.335 meters. Next, uh, C star. Again, recall, always recall this relation. C star is not only expressed as square root of RT0 or gamma that we have not here. This is information that we, we don't, don't have. But recall that C star is defined according to uh, total pressure mass flow rate and uh, um, trot area. So, uh, sorry, we had to cover weight <laughs> dot M and we can exploit C star because C star is defined this way, but also P0 
at is dot m c star. So dot m is p zero at over c star, and we have among data we have c star, we have found p zero and d t, so also a t, and we can uh, evaluate uh, easily our dot m. Consider that a t is a e over epsilon and is therefore 0 0.088 squared meters. And uh, by substitution, we obtain that dot m is equal to 221.3 kilograms per second. And at this point, of course, once we know the mass flow rate and we know the different values of trust, we can evaluate our specific impulse in the condition we, we desire. For instance, a vacuum condition. We realize 2590.8 meter per second that corresponds to a value in seconds. Uh, two, five, six, four point two seconds of specific impulse. So this completes this exercise. I hope you have followed it. Do you have questions about it? Everything is clear? As I receive no comments, it means that uh, it's either clear or you'll see later, as probably you'll do. So uh, the final exercise about uh, the this part that I recommend to evaluate carefully to to make exercise on this because uh, on trust coefficient on specific parts on characteristic velocity because it's something that. Uh, you, you will uh, be probably uh, requested to calculate during your practice class. And the reason is that this is the core of performance of thermal rockets. It's the core for the analysis of performance of thermal rockets. And based on this, of course, you can you move towards more accurate evaluations. So a final exercise on this will be uh, that of considering a special nozzle, which is done this way. You have a, a conical shape, a 15 degree angle. And you also have here something like this, which is a truncated cone that can move in this direction so that we have that we can change the area ratio at a given altitude. So this is an extendable exit cone nozzle. And you have two adaptation altitudes. The first adaptation altitude is selected to be at four kilometers and the second adaptation altitude is fixed to nine kilometers of altitude. Mm. So we the, the information we have is that P0 is 9 megapascal and uh, C star is 1600 meter per second gamma is 1.2 and uh, trust at sea level is 4 meganewtons. So we like to evaluate our areas, and in particular the trot area, AT, the first, the, the exit area, the first adaptation altitude, 
let's call it AE4 and AE9, which is the exit area at the second adaptation altitude. So we use the, 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 the same expression that we used before for the pressure uh, evolution with the altitude. And using this, we I can um, uh, also, uh, yes, we would like also to evaluate our specific impulse at 10 kilometers. So from the expression of the evolution of atmospheric pressure with altitude, we obtain PSL. I want to spend time on this, of course, now. For kilometers, we have 61636 Pascal, P9 is uh, 30737, and P10, because we are like to compute the specific impulse there is 26431. It's the same, but okay. I know it was 11. We never, we never evaluated before this P10. So, with this data, what we, shall we do? Suggestions from your side? So I think we, we make a break here so that uh, who of you uh, want to, to have an idea about how to solve this problem at some time available. So I, I will uh, resume our practice class in 10 minutes as usual at 1.10. But in the meantime, who of you is doing something in this practice class if any, you can uh, um, try to solve this problem. I would like also to to exploit to 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 use this uh, this time to to ask you uh, about that we we received some uh, email uh, concerning the the presence of next week, and I would like to uh, to ask you you all who is uh, requesting explicit his participation to le lectures in presence uh, and is not in the, the group that is allowed to reserve his, per, uh, his participation through the prodigious system. I would like to, uh, to ask you to make your request as soon as possible so that we can collect requests and uh, give you the authorization. So I think there will be no problem because I don't expect uh, huge numbers, but please uh, do the request. Possibly the, the best thing to do would be that you uh, send the, the, the information. Uh, if, you, if you know each other and you are planning to come together, please send a single email with more than one name signed by more than one people, but uh, at least we reduce the number of emails that will reach us, and so also the answer will be easier. In any case, 
I uh, recommend you to ask this as soon as possible so that we can make the request for you or um, for insert you in the class before the beginning of next week. So please do it uh, today if you are planning to do it. Scusi, ma chi aveva fatto, chi aveva fatto la richiesta del percorso per seguire anche le lezioni che non avevo previsto è ancora valida? La richiesta è in passato, penso che vada fatta settimana per settimana. Io direi che adesso, visto che c'è stata l'interruzione e c'è una ripresa, della, delle lezioni in presenza io uh, raccomanderei di fare intanto la richiesta per chi non è previsto in presenza la prossima settimana eh, siete invitati a, a uh, inviare la vostra informazione insomma che intendete partecipare così che facciamo l'autorizzazione va bene, grazie Prego. scusi professore e una domanda sull'esercizio. Ah, non ho capito, quindi questi 15 gradi e l'inclinazione del cono è una quantità fissata? Cioè sì. il, il cono quindi è estendibile, non è che è diciamo, allargabile, quell'angolo rimane fisso? Sì, sì, l'informazione in realtà serve no. non per calcolarsi le aree, serve, diciamo, effettivamente quella serve per calcolare le lunghezze. Eh, infatti, ok, grazie.
So as we have available, the, the total pressure and the exit pressure, and of course gamma, <clears throat> it means that we uh, we know the area ratio at the two uh, adaptation altitudes, so for the two cones. And uh, if we have the, the, the area ratio, uh, of course, we should know the, the trot area to evaluate the exit area or vice versa. And uh, on the other hand, we have the side pressure, we have also trust, so we can try to exploit this information because also through the expansion ratio we can uh, get information about the trust coefficient and so again, on the basis of the trust definition of the trust coefficient, coefficient we can evaluate our trot area. So uh, first of all, let's compute our pressure ratios. Sorry, our, our area ratios based on. on uh, the, the, the pressure values that we have. Which are, the pressure ratios are 146 and 293. And from here we have that epsilon equal to gamma over, we have already written today this expression, so I don't, I don't write it again. We have epsilon, let's say, 4 and epsilon 9. And this will be equal respectively to 15.6 and 27.19. Uh, So at, at this point, we would like to exploit the fact that we know FSL is trust coefficient. P0, AT. So how to do it? Trust coefficient at C level. Of course, the trust coefficient is the adapted value plus uh, P minus PAAE divided by P0 AT. So it will be can be evaluated on the basis of PE minus P. SL over P0 by Epsilon. 
So this is in general. Now <clears throat> we can uh, uh, exploit one of the, these two expression and say that, uh, and always this on the basis of, let's say, the adaptation to four kilometers. Because this will be the, the trust at sea level. So as we extend the cone later, at higher altitudes at sea level, we are working with the basic condition, which is adapted at four kilometers. So we have to exploit the information we have of the nozzle adapted at four kilometers. So let's say adapted at four kilometers, this is P4 and this is epsilon 4. So that we have that this area ratio is the one related to this pressure ratio, this stress coefficient is the one related to this pressure ratio. And also, of course, the pressure is the exit pressure that we have, of course, for at four kilometers. It's the ambient pressure that we have at four kilometers, so this P4. So at this point, we uh, evaluate our CF adapted at four kilometers. That is, of course, our gamma square root to gamma or gamma minus one, one minus P4 over P0, gamma minus one over gamma, 1.687. I recall that gamma is 0.6485. And so uh, then we have just to substitute, to substitute numbers here in this expression and we obtain the CFCL is equal to 1.617. We go back to our uh, relation that uh, we have here for AT FSR over CFSR P0 and it results that is 0.275 square meters. So that, as we know, our epsilon, we have A4 is equal to 4.36 square meters and A9 is 7.5 square meters. So this is what uh, was requested because we have all the, this area. And then we need the specific impulse at uh, 10 kilometers. We can see that, and, uh, and we can look to the difference that we have with and without extended, uh, extended cone deployed. So for instance, if I evaluate CF, at 10 kilometers, but with uh, the first exit cone only, uh, the first cone only, we have, of course, is the adapted for plus P exit P4 minus P 10 kilometers over P0 and epsilon for the first cone, and it results to be 1.75, which is of course something more than the adapted value because we are at a higher altitude. So we have always that we increase towards the vacuum value that we have for that expansion ratio. Now, if we consider, however, the case where we have the adaptation at nine kilometers, so with the deployed extendable cone, we have P9 here, P10, P0, and Epsilon 9. It will be the trust coefficient higher. It will be 1.77. And this means that in terms of specific impulse, this means a difference of about 
3.4 seconds. In fact, if we multiply this value for our uh, C star of 1600 meter per second, we have that specific impulse, let's say 10.4, that means is 285.4 seconds. So this is of course CFC star divided G0, and you see that specific impulse, if you consider the basic cone, and at 10 kilometers, we have 285 seconds, 0.4. Whereas if I consider also the extended cone, so that we adapt at 9 kilometers, we have at 10 kilometers, the, the specific impulse will be 288.8 seconds. So there is a difference due to the second cone of 3.4 seconds. Uh, actually, consider that uh, I'd like to, to stress that small differences on specific impulse are always important because don't forget that this is the basic parameter that we have in this expression. Uh, so recall that uh, higher specific impulse allows you to save propellant and uh, save also inert masses because of the less volume of propellant we need. And uh, so it's even a small increase of specific impulse is always desired. So if we can, of course, we will try to consider uh, engines with higher specific impulses. Of course, it depends on the cost and here, to get this increase, we have a, a bigger nozzle, so we have to save more weight than the additional weight that we have with this cone. And consider here that if you go to compute lengths, you have that you will uh, have a length for uh, the first cone, which is about, uh, uh, of course, can be evaluated as the 4 minus dt over twice tangent of alpha and this will be 3.29 meters big one and also in this case we have more than one meter more is 4.65 meters. Mm. So we have delta length, which is 1.36 meters. And one can estimate, for instance, uh, one select the material, the thickness of the wall, and uh, well, you can evaluate the, the lateral surface of this uh, truncated cone, so you can also evaluate the mass that you are adding to get this improvement of specific impulse. And of course, it means that it is worth only if you save more propellant, more mass of propellant than the additional mass that you have for this extended nozzle. So at this point, we um, this was the last exercise on this part. We move towards the chemical rockets at this point. And uh, the first thing that we have seen is the mixture of gases and the property of properties of these gas mixtures that uh, will be important because uh, we, we need to, to know the properties uh, to Let's say to see here in these expressions, we have, of course, our C star, our gamma, our gas constant, all these quantities are related to uh, the property of the gases we are expanding through uh, our nozzle. So we have to uh, also be able to evaluate these mixture properties. And we start with a basic exercise related to a mixture of carbon dioxide, CO2, and 
nitrogen N2. And uh, we have a mixture at one atmospheric pressure, we have pressure of one bar, and uh, we have specifically three kilograms of CO2 and one kilogram of N2, 1.5 kilograms, sorry, of N2. So as we, we know the properties of each of the gases, CO2, we know that the molar mass is 44 and uh, 28 for the N2. And this can be, of course, gram per moles or kilogram per kilomoles. And we have that uh, the CP of these gases is uh, 37.13.13 and 29.12 and here they are given in kilojoule per kilomole per Kelvin. So we have to evaluate the molar mass of the mixer, the CP of the mixer, the partial pressures, and the molar and mass fractions. We finally, we also evaluate the density. If I assume that T is equal to 298.15 Kelvin. Basic exercise, we start with this because we have to be able to handle these mixtures. So you recall that molar mass can be obtained by the weighted average through the molar fractions of the molar masses of each species or the, the inverse of the molar mass can be obtained as the weighted average of inverse molar fractions, molar masses uh, weighted with mass fractions. So of course, uh, as you have uh, the, the values of the, the relative amount of uh, the species is given in kilograms, so you have directly, easily you can have the value of our y's here, because these are mass fractions, and overall we have 4.5 kilograms, and we have 3 kilograms of CO2, 1.5 kilograms of N2, and so we can just make the ratio with the, the overall value of 4.5 and we have the, the y's. Y CO2 is equal to 3 kilograms over 4.5 kilograms. And so it's the relative amount mass of CO2 compared to the whole mixer. And this is 2 thirds, so it's 0.667. Of course, the remaining amount, remaining fraction, is of the other species, which is N2, and we have here 1.5 or 4.5 or 1 minus YCO2, and will be 0.333. 
So we can directly obtain at this point the molar mass based on the second formula, the one obtained in terms of y's. Anyway, we have also to, uh, to evaluate our uh, molar fraction six. And uh, to do that, we have to exploit that uh, we have to evaluate the number of moles that we have of each species. So, as we know the mass, we know the molar mass, we can evaluate the number of moles. Also here, this allows us to recall the definitions, because we can say that the number of moles of CO2 will be given by the mass that we have of CO2 divided by the molar mass of CO2. So if we have here to consider three kilograms and uh, 44 kilograms per kilomole, we have to consider on this point three over 44, and it means that is 0.0688. Two kilomoles. That uh, can also be expressed in moles and will be 68.2 moles. Similarly, we can do for the nitrogen, the number of moles is the mass nitrogen that we have divided by the molar mass of nitrogen at this 1.5 over 28. 0 0.0536 kilomole or 53.6 moles. So the overall number of moles is 8, 1, and uh, 1, 2, so under 21.8, and you can divide, this is n, and so, of course, x CO2 will be n CO2 over the overall number of moles. And so you make the division, and you obtain, this is 0.56, and here you can also avoid to make division just one minus x CO2, x and two will be 0.44. So at this point you can evaluate the molar mass of the mixture. Some xi mi so you see this is xco2 mco2 that is 44 plus x and 2.44 by m molar mass of n2 which is You obtain your the molar mass of the mixer. Of course, with the, the molar fraction, you also have the partial pressure. And so this is also trivial. And uh, yes, what's, what's more, uh, we have also to evaluate at this point the CP. And uh, we have the value of the each species at the temperature and pressure. So we know that uh, if we are going to evaluate the molar CP because these values here in the table, 
I give you here. Actually, they are molar value because you see four kilomoles. And uh, so the molar value of the mixture will be the sum of Xi CPI. And we obtain here 0.56 by 37.13 plus 0.44 and uh, 29.12 and we have this result in terms of uh, Constant pressure specific heat for our mixture is 33.61 joule mole Kelvin or kilojoule kilo mole Kelvin. So we have this value, and it's interesting at this point also to evaluate our CV and then gamma. CV will be CP minus the universal gas constant. And in terms of joule kilo, uh, Joule per mole per Kelvin. We have that this gas content is 8.314. So that we have the RCV is 25.29 Joule mole Kelvin. Our gamma. express as the ratio of either molar or specific values of CP results to be 1.33. Note also that the gas constant is the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass of the mixture in this case and will be based on the results we have obtained 225 joule Kelvin kilogram. And this would be convenient to evaluate the necessary to evaluate our density. Of the mixture, so we have to put the overall pressure here and the mixture gas constant and we have 1.51 kilogram per cubic meter. It's about this. E una domanda, ma in questo caso noi stiamo considerando come se non ci sia una reazione, nel senso se 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 penso per esempio a H2 più mezzo 2 che dà H2O, allora mi viene da dire che la somma delle moli di H2 e di O2 non fa no le moli di H2O. Invece qua le abbiamo sommate. E, non so, sì, non è, insomma, è, la domanda. Sì, la domanda, eh, ho capito la domanda. Non stiamo facendo una reazione. Quando se, se facciamo riferimento a quello che ha detto lei, appunto alla reazione H2 più, ad esempio, un mezzo 2 che dà H2O. Noi stiamo guardando a quello che succede prima. Cioè, prima che reagiscano, abbiamo una miscela di H2 e un mezzo 2. Non stiamo considerando una reazione. Qui stiamo considerando che ci troviamo di fronte a una determinata miscela. Punto. Come dire... L'ambiente atmosferico è fatto di ossigeno e azoto, c'è cioè una certa percentuale di azoto, una certa percentuale di ossigeno, vediamo quali sono le proprietà, che so, per l'atmosfera, ad esempio, se M dell'ossigeno è 32 e M dell'azoto è 28, visto che tre quarti è azoto e un quarto è ossigeno, si vede che viene circa... 29 come peso molecolare medio, no, esattamente questo stiamo facendo, quindi medie eh, di un gas 
di una miscela di gas che sappiamo essere in equilibrio con una determinata composizione. Va bene, grazie. Quindi il numero di moli, per esempio, che abbiamo trovato sono le moli della miscela, insomma, però senza reazione, senza considerare... Sì, sì, nessuna reazione. Abbiamo, okay. o se vuole, dopo infinite reazioni, dopo secoli, ci siamo ritrovati con un chilo e mezzo di, di azoto e tre chili di anidride carbonica. Con questa roba messa insieme, che proprietà c'ha? Va bene. Questo. Partiamo dalla cosa più semplice. Adesso facciamo degli step in cui man mano ci andremo a complicare la vita. Ma ovviamente ben venga questa domanda perché deve essere chiaro che dobbiamo partire dalle cose più elementari e poi saperle distinguere da quelle più, più complicate. Grazie mille. So, the next step uh, will, will include uh, the chemical equilibrium. And uh, according to, to, or similarly to what was requested before, what we, we are considering now is a different reaction, but always with H2 and O2. We consider this reaction where we have H2 and O2, which form OH. We know that uh, this is uh, an endothermic reaction. So we have that the heat of formation is in this case positive. And this is the molar one, and this 38.99. Kilojoule per mol. So we know that we would like to analyze this at 20, uh, 2000 Kelvin. And uh, at this temperature where we analyze this uh, reaction, we have that Kp is equal to 0.638. So we'd like to evaluate the, the molar and mass fractions at P equal to one bar and P equal to 100 bar. So at this, in this case, we have to exploit the We have the, the equilibrium constant, and we have to exploit the relation between the equilibrium constant and the, the molar fractions that we have seen in class. <clears throat> you see that this is a special case, and so this question is, is a trick. It's not, uh, it's just to, to confuse you, because to confuse you, uh, joking, but. Uh, The reason is that why, why this is useless information because we don't have a role of pressure because this is a zero order reaction. We have the, the number of moles of products or the, the coefficient, the sum of, of um, stoichiometric coefficient of products is the same as the uh, sum of stoichiometric coefficients of the reactants. So. <clears throat> We have that there is no role of pressure, and in fact, if I can write Kp, that in principle should be based on the partial pressure expressed in atmosphere, POH, uh, is the partial pressure of product to the stoichiometric coefficient, which is 1, so this is to the power 1, and for reactants, they are, they are a denominator. And we have P H2, partial pressure of H2, one half, partial pressure two of O2 to the power one half, which are the stoichiometric coefficients. So this is just, of course, a review uh, of uh, what you know and you already practiced in the past. And uh, of course, our P will be 
the uh, Xi by the mixture pressure. And of course, here our P will cancel because you have P a numerator and P to one half plus one half equal to P at the denominator. So this is also equal to XOH, XH to one half, XO to one half. So we have no role of pressure. So either one bar, 100 bar, nothing changes in this case. This is a special case, of course. It's not always this the case. Uh, yes, so how to evaluate these values here? So of course you can evaluate our uh, fractions, uh, our mass fractions or the number of or a relation is equivalent to them in the number of, among the number of moles. But uh, you see here that we have one relation, three unknowns, but actually there are only two because we know that sum xi is equal to one. And so we need to find another relation among these quantities to close the problem. And we can do it of course, con considering, as we told in, we discussed in class, the conservation of atoms. So actually, we have to imagine something that we, is different uh, from, uh, we have seen the reaction forward and backward written in the classical scheme as shown before. Uh, we can see this also in this way, that we start with this mixture, and we obtain this other mixture where we have a number of moles of products overall, which are distributed with their X as oxygen, as molecular oxygen, molecular hydrogen, and OH. So if we see this in this way, we have to consider the balance of O atoms and H atoms. And uh, so that we have that the number of atoms of uh, H2, atoms of moles, that we have on this left hand side and uh, um, must be equal to we have H here and here we have one, two H here uh, and uh, and one H on OH so we have two times and um, P X H2 and uh, plus N P X O H. Of course, we can do something also here. We can say that we have a given number of moles of reactants and if we have this number of moral reactants, we have that this number H2 will be one half is the stoichiometric coefficient. Uh, well, it's also the, the mass fraction, the molar fraction, because we have one mole here and R is equal to one. So we see that uh, XH2 as a reactant is one half. X O2 as reactant is one half. And so this NH2, if NR is equal to one, we have just uh, one half by the number of atoms of uh, one molecule of H2 is two. So this is will be uh, in this way. And we can write similarly for the number of atoms of the conservation of atoms of uh, O2 
actually everything is symmetric here. So we have these two relations. And uh, actually, uh, so we can make the ratio of the two expressions and uh, simplify. So the number here on, on the left hand side is the same. So we have that one is equal to and p cancelled. So it would be the second unknown. We have we are not to compute NP, it's not uh, of our interest at this point. So in these two equations, we give NP and one relation among the X. And if we make the ratio, we remove X NP and we have just the relation among the different uh, moral fractions. So we have here that it becomes two X hydrogen plus XOH. divided by 2 XO2 plus XOH. Uh, so you see evidently that here it must be, you see just looking to the expression, that it must be XH2 is equal to XO2. And uh, then you know that uh, X H two plus X O two plus X O H is equal to one, and so from here you see that uh, twice uh, X H two is equal to one minus X O H. So we have found these two relations, and the third one is the, the equilibrium one that we have here. So we have three equations in three unknowns. And uh, we can solve it by substitution. Uh, actually, we find that Kp is equal to XOH here. And the denominator we have square root of XH2, square root of XO2, they are equal. So we have just one minus XOH half because we have twice the square root of it. This and this. So the result is that is twice XOH over one minus XOH. We know the value of KP is one of the data. We solve and we have 0.242. And from here, we obtain that XH2 is equal to 0.379. XO2 is 0.379. Now, in this special case, we have to evaluate the molar mass of products of reaction with that would be some xi mi so uh, let's assume here based on what we know from the periodic table the values of molar masses are for h2 is 2 for o2 we have 32 and for OH, there will be 16 plus 1, 17. So, as I mentioned, this was a special case, and you see here that if you consider now uh, 0.242 by 17 plus 0.379, 2 plus 32. So this is exactly the sum because we have the same X for hydrogen and oxygen. And so I sum, I group this in the single parenthesis and we see that the result is 17. And actually it would be any value of 
uh, any position of of the reaction here. If you have just this reaction, the results will always be 17. But this is, again is just because this is a special case. Così, uh, because of the, the sì. Um, non è che potrebbe cortesemente ripetere prima quando abbiamo fatto il sistema, cioè il sistema un mezzo per due, e due righe, esatto, queste due, come, cioè, come le scriviamo insomma? Sì, questo è il numero di, di, di moli che abbiamo uh, di reagenti, supponiamo che sia uno, e quindi essendo uh, la proporzione molare un mezzo un mezzo sono metà idrogeno e metà ossigeno, quindi le frazioni molari sono un mezzo e mezzo, d'accordo? Allora, il, eh, se vogliamo contare gli atomi, sapendo che il numero di atomi dentro una mole è sempre lo stesso, eh, scusi, il numero di molecole è sempre lo stesso, gli atomi qui di idrogeno sono due volte il numero di molecole di idrogeno. Quindi se calcoliamo il numero di molecole sarà proporzionale al numero di moli, quindi dobbiamo moltiplicare per due perché abbiamo due atomi per molecola e poi moltiplicare per un mezzo perché abbiamo mezza mole di idrogeno per ogni mole di reagenti. A destra abbiamo le moli di prodotti che sono NP, incognite, per ogni mole di prodotto abbiamo una frazione x di eh, moli, quindi x H2 per NP è il numero di moli di idrogeno che avremo da questa parte e per ogni mole di idrogeno avremo due atomi di idrogeno, quindi per considerare gli atomi dovremo moltiplicare per 2 il numero di moli di idrogeno che è NP per x H2. E a queste dobbiamo sommare gli atomi di idrogeno che sono presenti nella molecola OH e qui abbiamo un atomo di idrogeno per ogni molecola e un numero di moli pari a NP per XOH e quindi vediamo questo quest altro termine qui. Similmente per, facciamo la stessa cosa per le moli e quindi gli atomi. Attraverso le moli diciamo, valutiamo la proporzione degli atomi di ossigeno tra reagenti e prodotti. Quindi se sono chiare queste due righe, a questo punto abbiamo come incognite, sicuramente abbiamo aggiunto un'incognita che è NP, che è il numero di moli di prodotti che corrisponde a una mole di reagenti, e poi abbiamo, avendo due relazioni, abbiamo anche una relazione tra le X. Siccome adesso stiamo cercando la relazione tra le X, eh, eliminiamo NP e otteniamo, facendo il rapporto tra queste due equazioni e otteniamo questa relazione che poi svolgiamo. Grazie, ma, ma NH2 quindi è il numero di moli e di H2? No, non so perché pensavo che il numero di moli di H2... No, no, hai ragione, me... questo NH2 è, è... Sarebbe NH? È fuorviante, sì. Ok. Grazie. Oh, grazie a lei. So I just to conclude this exercise, giving you also the results in terms of mass fractions and mass fraction of OH can be obtained as XOH by the relation between the molar and mass fractions. We, uh, once we know the, um, the mixture and the species Uh, molar mass we can relate one to the other with this relation that we have seen in class and so here we have 0.242 which is uh, actually the same as the, the the molar fraction because we have the same MOH is equal to M uh, whereas this is not the case of course for Y H2 which is 0.379, this is the X, H2, M, H2 over M, and it becomes 0.045. So in mass, of course, there will be less hydrogen, which is lighter.
this is of course this is 32 this is 2 this is 17 17 17 point two four two and the result is point seven one three so in mass we have a quite more oxygen than other species as this is not the case in, in terms of moles because the lightest the lighter species occupy more volume so that's all for today and uh, we will uh, see next monday for the usual lecture class professore scusi io una domanda prego ma eh, il caso cioè è speciale perché semplicemente questa combinazione di atomi casualmente fornisce sempre 17 come risultato per la massa molare oppure c'è cioè, una ragione no no è il caso speciale ah, è, il, okay. è, il che, è il fatto che abbiamo un mezzo un mezzo da una parte e uno dall'altro e viene fuori così se prende la reazione provi a fare lo stesso esercizio perché qui può scegliere qualunque proporzione, no? quindi se fa la conservazione atomica e, eh, e mette uguale a 1 la somma delle x, considerando H2, O2 e H2O, e sceglie arbitrariamente un valore di x, H2O, e di conseguenza si calcola il valore di, di, di x, H2 e x, O2, vedrà che non ottiene un risultato indipendente da x può fare questo esercizio per, per convincersi. Ok, perfetto, grazie.